He was a real Renaissance man, and he was very exciting. And I think it's it, every time there's another show, more and more scholarship is written about him. A series of touring shows pays tribute to what would have been his 100th birthday. Yes, thank you. I appreciate everyone being here this evening for the Romare Beard and Southern Recollections exhibition. Um, this is the third venue that the exhibition has gone to. It originated in Charlotte. Memories from Charlotte, his cherished hometown, often appeared in many of the artist's polished works. He was just an extraordinarily loving man. And um, if he were here for this, he would still be just quiet, roaming. Romare Bearden's view of the world raised the profile of those once disenfranchised from the mainstream. I had never seen black people represented so beautifully, so sensuously, so completely. We did the whole record in, in a day, I think. It's amazing that he stopped painting for a little while and took his hand at, at writing lyrics and, and music. And he's credited as one of the writers on Seabreeze. Right? By the 60s, society struggles would influence his craft. I could see that the whole civil rights uh, movement uh, uh, helped inspired a number of things that he had done. The next decade would bring no noted accolades. He's considered the foremost African-American artist of the, uh, of the 20th century. Those who admired him and knew his work said, Bearden's place and presence is deeply rooted in the content of his craft. He's just a great artist and uh, he's, he's, he's worldwide power. A street sign on the city's west side bears the Bearden name and in Charlotte's business district, a fitting tribute honors the memory of this homegrown artist. Hello and welcome, I'm Steve Crump. Back in 1911, Romare Bearden was born just blocks away from this prestigious Third Ward Charlotte showplace, the Mint Museum. It is the home of a permanent exhibit that honors his legacy. But in 2011, across this community, the Mint, as well as a number of arts institutions, kicked off a cultural celebration designed to inform and educate. Festivities surrounding the 100th anniversary of the birth in his noted hometown were indeed a community collaboration. The Southern Recollections exhibit started here and went up and down the East Coast. Following the colorful works attracted thousands and offered a number of insights into Bearden's ability. And seeing the pieces in a personal way provides perspective regarding how his creations manage to touch people from all walks of life. Buzz and excitement were created over this artist and his public displays, not just in locales where he once lived and worked, but in the places where new audiences were born. Taking it all in from city to city was a big and meaningful part of Romare Bearden's centennial celebration. Comprehending such a compelling legacy of one of the nation's best-known artists required executing a far-reaching range of hometown events that widely celebrated moments of inspired creativity. By design, so many of the vibrant soundtracks carried out at gatherings to honor Romare Bearden were largely rooted in jazz. The same musical expression made in America, he also boldly applied to many of his remarkable creations. He lived uh, uh, amazing episodes of uh, the American experience and the African-American experience. He was talking to the great artists of the time, the great uh, leaders of the time. He had the benefit of the, de of the debate, of the ideas. I mean, the whole, his whole environment was, was crackling with uh, intellectual activity. So he was such a three-dimensional person and personality. He was a baseball player in college. Uh, his mother worked for the Chicago Defender as a correspondent. The career-defining compositions which gave life to his craft were carried out in New York's Soho district. During the 1960s, stirring images that commanded so much attention began at the artist Canal Street walk-up. It is this style and technique 
that opened his mind to the perfection of his signature craft known as collage. Bearden's Lower Manhattan Studio became the place where the Charlotte-born artist loudly discovered his voice with remarkable clarity and eventually redefined the art form. If you do a collage, how do you do that without dealing with Bearden? It became his voice that is so singular that it just bent the light <laughs> around him. And I think he opened up a whole new genre, a whole new area for a whole lot of artists to follow in. I mean, what Bearden did probably had some influence on some of the other folks who came later. He took the medium of collage and took it further than Picasso. He broadened it. He made us see ourselves. And that's, that, that's Romeo Bearden. He saw Picasso as his great antagonist, you know, but, and he's done for America what, what Picasso, Picasso has done for the world. It, it's very important for the black community to see the importance of Bearden because he is America's foremost collages. The collages are layered physically, but the ideas are layered so that um, Mecklenburg County is interwoven with Harlem and interwoven with the Caribbean. While exquisite craftsmanship resonates deeply throughout the Bearden visual narrative, scores of headlines chronicling such a remarkable career trumpeted the fact that his works amplified a dignified sense of cultural identity. You know, he tried cartoons, he did painting, and then he went from social realist painting to the figurative abstractions, and then from there he didn't paint quite so much, did songwriting, and then he came back. And it, was, it took him a long time to get to, to arrive at the collages. But he arrived and it was home. He, he invented home. And once he invented home, it was like, okay, now I'm here. Charlotte is the North Carolina city that influenced Romare Bearden in his formative years during the second decade of the 20th century. In his native Mecklenburg County, the early phases of life carried out near the center of town shaped his childhood and influenced the calling of a career. Charlotte was then a community offering a balance between urban street landscapes and rural Americana. The industrial idea identity of the Carolina's largest city was closely connected to the humming of cotton gins and thriving textile mills. When Romare Howard Bearden was born to a prominent African-American family of fashionable means in the city's third ward, the dividing lines in North Carolina was largely defined by class, culture, as well as race and their limiting barriers of the time. Well, Mecklenburg County was absolutely essential. I can't ignore it at all. He was born there. He went back there often as a child. He went back there as an adult seeking uh, his family roots. There are wonderful photographs of that. It's a snapshot. It's, a, it's one man's image. Of, the, of what Charlotte was and his memories, when he, the, the things that he draws visually. I think Charlotte realizes that they have a unique position vis-a-vis -vis Bearden because of his interest and because he did that series of Mecklenburg County pieces. I mean, had he only done New York and Chicago, I don't know that we would have felt that kinship, at least in terms of something to promote but he did do Mecklenburg County. It's what he saw, it's what he read, it's what he listened to, it's everything about him. We, we claim him, but I'm not sure how much of what he had become had Charlotte in him. Many of his polished pieces carried the name of a place complete with humble beginnings. Among the well-known titles are Carolina Shout and Mecklenburg Autumn. Charlotte is a place where he would visit maybe a little bit when he um, came back, you know, for the summers. Paying public tribute to the lifetimes and contributions of Romare Bearden became a full-time obsession for former Mint Museum curator Carla Hansel. Decision makers at the Mint took a leap of faith by broadening the Bearden brand. Museum staffers, the public, as well as private donors, packaged some of these works by turning this retrospective into a traveling road show. And what comes out of his art is this idea 
that African Americans aren't a part of America. They are America. The next phase of putting these works on the road for a national audience brought a share of bittersweet moments. It was very emotional for us to say goodbye to Bearden for a while, but of course we know he'll be coming home again. His early works were drawn from his experiences in the South, painted in vivid tempera and recalling agrarian life and community bonds. His iconic collage technique emerged in the 1960s, and his work moved from literal images to a surrealistic blend. Mark Washburn, The Charlotte Observer, August 30th, 2011. Lingering flashbacks of vibrant steel mills and winding rivers were part of Romare Bearden's lasting connection to Pittsburgh. It was a place offering a bustling downtown and early 20th century exposure to players from the Negro Leagues. Memories and perhaps personal metaphors from Pennsylvania were deeply woven into the tapestry of Romare Bearden's psyche during his adolescent years. This is the city he called home during the 1920s twenties while attending Peabody High School. Etched mental images of black factory workers who lived in his grandmother's boarding house and the backbreaking labor they performed would later provide the charged elements of realism for a compelling visual narrative. Other cherished slices of life from this city are deeply connected to his craft. There are all kinds of mysteries about the guy because people when he lived there, I didn't know him, obviously. As mysteries continue to unfold beyond Charlotte's formative years, Pittsburgh is a place that offered eye-opening expansion and heart-stirring growth. Bearden's broad view of the world was shaped in part by this working-class community, and the powerful memories that never abandoned his spirit would influence one of the city's greatest creative minds. The renowned playwright August Wilson was deeply touched and moved by his talent. Like an August Wilson and like a Romare Bearden, weave into your work and your life's work that the world sees a mirror for, for folks to see themselves in. And in that mirror, they can see parts of who they are and parts of who you are and where you came from. And you make that a part of, of, of your overall aesthetic statement, then you can't help but be proud of that. Andre Guess is the former director of the August Wilson Center in Pittsburgh. And Wilson once said of Bearden, quote, When I saw his work, it was the first time that I'd seen black life presented in all its richness. And I said, I want to do that. I want my plays to be the equal of his canvases. Along the rail lines in the Steel City, it's not canvas, but rather perfected tiles. It's viewed by thousands of Pennsylvania commuters every day. To be exact, 780 squares, one end of the 60-foot-long beard and mural titled Pittsburgh Recollections. Pittsburgh is a city that I know for most of the outside world is defined by sports, and that's fine, we'll, we'll own that. But when you have a chance to visit Pittsburgh, you really understand the very strong role that the arts play here, um, historically and in a contemporary time. Located in downtown's Gateway Center, this station is one of the busier stops for the Allegheny County Port Authority's light rail system. The visual statements Bearden made about this community speaks volumes when it comes to industry and technology, memories of music, and the role of early American settlers. Back in 1984, 83, somewhere in that neighborhood, I think we paid somewhere around $92,000 for the creation of this mural. As this region of Pennsylvania expanded the reach of its light rail line, the beard and mural had to be moved across town. Along the way came the steps of restoration and new appraisals, which led to an unexpected discovery. We said we better get an evaluation of this mural before we start that into that process so for insurance purposes we could cover the value. And we were incredibly surprised to find out that it was worth in the neighborhood of $15 million. He is a, a, an integral part of the tapestry of, of what it means to be a Pittsburgh. That's woven into the fabric of the ethic of this town in terms of a work ethic. 
His collage painting, The Piano Lesson, for example, was the inspiration for August Wilson's Pulitzer Prize winning play of the same title, Mr. Wilson's Joe Turner's Come and Gone. Another in his 10-play Pittsburgh cycle was similarly inspired by Mr. Bearden's Mill Hands Lunch Bucket. Mary Thomas, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, March 30th, 2012. The rigors of moving such a precious and prestigious collection brought on a series of carefully executed travel days. So when it came to parting company with the Southern Recollections exhibition in the city of Bearden's birth, decision makers at the Mint targeted several markets to grow new audiences for the artist and his work. It would take off for parts further south. Destination, Florida's third largest city, Tampa. We actually wanted to um, push the traditional definitions of the South uh, with this tour. And so I think going to Tampa allowed us to do that in a really interesting way. After sunset, the Tampa Museum of Art is a gleaming jewel along the banks of the Hillsborough River. Not far away, this wide spectrum of ranging color added newfound character to the city's nighttime sky. The name Romare Bearden was bathed in bright lights. It invites you in, and I think for, for many in our audience, it's a great opportunity to engage with an artist and engage with a style. In a broad sense, this is an exhibition about an artist and a place. Mecklenburg County meant so much to Romeo that to the end of his life, he kept returning here through his art. Because I got a chance to meet him. Harlem became the place where musician Branford Marcellus would rub elbows with the artist. The meet and greet opportunity came at the suggestion of his former wife. They had this sale, buy a Bearden, 2,500 bucks, meet the painter. I was talking to my dad, yeah man, you know, Tess wants me to spend 2,500 bucks on this painting. Meet this guy, he's like, who is it, Romero Bearden? He says, Get your ass up to Harlem and meet this man. <laughs> I said, buddy, he says, there ain't no buts, go. Go, we'll talk about it later. So I said, all right, I'll buy one. And then I met him, and an hour later, I was like, okay, I'll buy three. Years after the introduction in Harlem, something changed. I had uh, three beardens. I lost them in a divorce settlement. Well, I didn't lose them, I just said, here, you can please take them, because now that I'm a bachelor, I'm I'm just gonna spill beer on him. However, when the Bearden retrospective was unveiled at the National Gallery, Branford Marcellus would have a critical role. At the same time of the art show, he released this CD titled, Romare Bearden Revealed. Among the tracks paying tribute to the artist is Seabreeze, which was first recorded by Billy Eckstein. Seabreeze, flowing to the shore. On the 2003 version is strictly instrumental. The melodies honor his many talents. He chose not to limit himself. And uh, he did it very humbly. If New York's electric environment added life, excitement, and energy to Romare Bearden's art, then it was Baltimore offering the springboard for his characterizations to gain greater exposure. I think that there is something very compelling about the totality of Romare Beard. That's not so much about the collage or the material being used as much as the subject matter that he was addressing, uh, the inclusion of us in a very powerful way. New inspiration came from a moment that attracted the masses. Just 100 years after Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves, 200,000 people converge on the nation's capital to rally for civil rights. They come by train. Just down the road from Baltimore, the 1963 March on Washington is widely credited for inspiring Bearden's perfection of collage. However, the issue of civil rights had already been boldly etched into his subconscious decades earlier. On that monumental day, E.T. Williams had a historic front row seat. Nearly 50 years later, he would chair the Romare Bearden Foundation. As time went on and I got to see more of his work, I could see that the whole civil rights uh, movement uh, 
uh, helped inspire a number of things that he had done. In the 60s was such an intense time in the world at large and in the art world. And Bearden was right at the center of every aspect of it. And I think a highly political artist. For more than 100 years, the Baltimore Afro-American has taken the mantle of being the mouthpiece, mirror, and microscope of many black concerns. Decades later, and even online, the publication remains relevant. This place is a treasure chest of black history, um, and we are very thankful it's been preserved for so long. The second floor of its Charles Street offices is a treasure trove bearing witness to the fight for equality. Fragile pages buried in the stacks of previous editions offer a window to a cherished past. Aging reminders serve up the datelines of a different place and time. It was, it was not a very, it's certainly not a very positive uh, reflection of what was going on, which means that the news during that time period was obviously very dreary. As the country was coming to grips with the Great Depression during the 1930s, the artist used his talent at this paper to share the stories of those shut out of America's mainstream. John Gartrell is the Afro's chief archivist. And so it, it, it's not a surprise that Bearden would have been at the forefront of speaking out a, about those things um, because he would have been of that generation that maybe wasn't as in your face about it um, as, it, as certainly we see in the 50s and 60s where you have the, the onslaught of the sit-ins and the, the marches and sort of the overt protests. The, the artwork that he was putting into the paper, the, the editorial cartoons, um, they're very dark, they're very dreary. Baltimore is also headquarters for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and is home base of the NAACP's Crisis Magazine. Founded by W.E.B. Du Bois and later edited by Roy Wilkins, the crisis since 1910 has been the official publication of one of the nation's oldest civil rights organizations. Front page images of individuals like General Benjamin Oliver Davis, Mary McLeod Bethune, and Joe Lewis appeared below the banner. And tucked away between the covers, readers were able to find the art of Romare Bearden, who was then in his early 20s. This could almost be a cartoon of right now. We have recovery issues. There's recovery on the horizon. Like his late father, we National NAACP Chairman Kelly Alexander Sr. Kelly Jr., a former national board member and past president of the North Carolina branches, served as a periodic contributor to the magazine. Bearden's published views in the crisis were often ahead of their time. It had given voice to people whose ideas were socially considered radical at the time, but as we move you know, forward uh, to the here and now, those views are not radical, those views are the norm. Unrest at Southern College campuses fueled one of the most compelling storylines of the 1960s. However, 30 years before the federal government sent troops to help integrate the University of Alabama, Bearden fearlessly called out the inequities of Jim Crow laws in that state. He's making sort of larger, almost metaphorical statements about how culture is produced, how culture survives, in a sense, how we live together, which is a sort of a larger definition of politics. Beyond political statements for the Baltimore-based publications, his work lives every day in this East Coast city for all to see. Just like Pittsburgh, Commuters during their morning and evening journeys are exposed to another piece of public art. This one can be found along the Maryland Transit Administration's rail line. This uh, is the uh, Upton District, uh, which was home to the world-famous Royal Theater. Performers who carried out their talents on stage were idolized in a creation titled Baltimore Uproar. It brought attention to a beard and pastime, jazz, and recognizes one of the city's best-known performers. Remember the tribute to Mary Lou Williams from his Pittsburgh efforts? By design, another iconic entertainer with Maryland roots would have a starring role of the subway station creation. The presence 
of Billie Holiday is broadly acknowledged in her hometown. The 14 by 46 foot mosaic is made of Venetian glass. While operators of the transit line have not had the work appraised in recent years, they're confident this piece of public art is valued in the range of seven figures. Imagine being on the panel that had a chance to review the work of a Romar Bearden and say, we think we'll go with this guy and let him have a shot at this. And then to look all these many years later at how his legacy has come round and the art world now having this tremendous appreciation for his talent, his gifts, and so forth. For us to have been smart enough here in the city of Baltimore to say this is one of the artists that we want to have housed forever in our metro subway system, it's just, uh, it's a tremendous gift. Bearden synthesized not only his own visual and lived experience, but also great chunks of 20th century art and the cultures that fed it. His collages point to our present and beyond in ways that still, years after his death, we barely know. Roberta Smith, The New York Times, March 31st, 2011. If Romare Bearden's revered creations evolved from memorable autobiographical experiences, then it's easy to understand why various regions of the country are now claiming a sense of territorial ownership. So he's born in the South, then his family leaves for the North. Eight months after its opening in Sherman, the Southern Recollections Tour made a final stop at New Jersey's Newark Museum of Art. Eighty works featured in this exhibition span the career of this world-renowned artist. The narrative and themes that run through this exhibition tell the tale of his native South and its influence on his work. The attachment remains special in this big city environment where he came into his own. Globally today, just look at Romy, not just with an American, okay, likeness, but for the world to see Romy Bearden and how important he is. Meanwhile, the place of his birth offered a wellspring of constant inspiration, and 100 years later, Sherman is redefining his relationship with the city's best known artist. No question is Romare Bearden our artist and someone who was born here, raised here, and uh, you can see in his art that the South is all, is, is very present in what he, what he did. And the more we know about him, and the more we know of the things that he knew about, the more we can get from the work. Bearden is, it's important that he's a native son and that he gives us something to be proud of, in other words, gives us all something to be proud of. One of ours being recognized as, you know, very, very important artist. Romare Bearden deserves all the acclaim we can give him um, because he's given the city so much. You know, frankly, I think we, we can't do enough to talk about the influence of this artist on our city. Comprehending the milestone mark means embracing his work and absorbing the incredible and remarkable talents Clearly, he was a modern-day Renaissance man whose work on and off the canvas resonates loudly to the legion of longtime admirers and first-time followers. That's Romare Bearden's Centennial Celebration from the Mint Museum in Center City, Charlotte. I'm Steve Crump. Thanks so much for watching. Support for Romare Bearden's Centennial Celebration is made possible by a gift from the Arts and Science Council of Charlotte Mecklenburg. Additional support for this program comes from viewers like you. Thank you. Thank you.